word I'm led to share with you today, it is recorded in the book of Psalms, uh, and uh, we have uh, one more Sunday perhaps in the Psalms, and there's a message God has given me for this occasion. It is recorded in the book of Psalms, and the 22nd number of the Psalms, Psalms, Psalm number 22, or Psalm, Psalm selection 22, Psalm selection 22. Psalm Selection 22. Psalm Selection 22. Psalm Selection 22. And for the benefit of brevity, I want you to notice two verses with me. Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, or Psalm 22. It reads thusly, My God, my God, why hadst thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. God bless you. You may be seated. What an intriguing passage of scripture. I want to read it again. I want you to read it along with me. Some number 22 verse 1 my God my God why hast thou forsaken me why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring oh my God I cry in the daytime but thou hearest not and in the night season and am not silent amen I'm going to talk about this morning simply from this thought Overcoming the silence of heaven. Overcoming the silence of heaven. Overcoming the silence of heaven. My brothers and my sisters, there is a period that is in between the Old and New Testament that is called the intertestamental period. It is a very unique dispensation. Even now, 2,000 plus years later, it is a very eerie, eerie season. This time is an eerie season because it lasted for 400 years. The interim in between the Old and New Testament. A four centuries long season. It is not eerie because of the number of years. It is not even eerie because there was a paradigm shift in Palestine that saw how Hebrew culture totally transformed to Greek culture, Greek language, Greek speaking, Hellenism it was called. But this 400 year period in between the Old and New Testament, it is an eerie dispensation primarily because for the duration of this period there was no inspired word from God. There was no theophany. There was no prophet, minor or major, who spoke a word on behalf of divinity. For 400 years, literally, the heavens shut up. For 400 years, there was no word from God. My sisters and my brothers, can you imagine life lived for four weeks without hearing 
from God. Can you imagine life lived for four months, for four years, without any direct contact or visitation from on high? Such was the primary characteristic of the intertestamental period that God, because of the apostasy and hypocrisy of Israel, decided that he would no longer speak to them until he got ready to send forth his son Jesus in the fullness of time. What a blessing it is that God has allowed us to live in the 21st century that we don't have to be the recipients of such a dreadful and a deplorable moment a 400 year season when God is silent however my sisters and my brothers although there are times that we can celebrate the fact that God has blessed us to live in 2007 there are precarious predicaments that will arise that although we don't live in that intertestamental period, there are times that even right now when it seems that even heaven may be silent in our individual walks with the Lord. My brothers and my sisters, has there ever been a moment in your life when you've called for God to intervene? Has there ever been a time in your life when you sought help from on high? And yet it seems that the answer to your prayers is so evasive and pervasive. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, have you ever really got on your knees and asked God to bring something into fruition in your pilgrimage only to discover that what you've been asking for never seems to come to realization. Recently, I found myself in that type of predicament when noticing the rapid decay of my baby brother's body, when seeing that death look in his eyes. I began to pray that God would touch my brother and give him long life and give him health and body. And when God decided to call my brother from labor to reward, it, it made me ponder that theme again. Well, God, did you really hear me praying? I was taught as a boy that if I would ask, it would be given. My Sunday school teachers told me with regularity that if I would seek, I'd find. And if I just would knock, that the door would be open. I was told that we have not because we ask not. I was told that we can always come boldly before his throne to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in our time of need. What happens when we've come boldly before the throne? What happens when we've asked? What happens when we've sought and not? But yet, it seems that heaven does not have one answer to your petition. And perhaps I'm speaking to some people in this room today, or those who watch me right now by television, who may not want to agree publicly, but privately you've pondered that reality of this rather forbidding and foreboding analysis of the Christian condition. And that is, is it possible for me to pray? And God never responds. Is it possible for me to ask God to give me a job and yet I still find myself jobless? Is it possible to ask God for a spouse but yet I'm still lonely. Is it possible to ask God 
for college tuition, but yet it seems like the financial aid department has lost their last piece of everlasting mind. What, what, what happens when I've been asking and praying and seeming that the answer to my prayer is so evasive and so pervasive, such as the case in our text this morning? For in all probability, David found himself in the wilderness of Maon as a fugitive fleeing for his life because of the assassination attempts of that first monarch of Israel's history by the name of Saul. David writes here, and his work is not only poetic, but it is deemed as being prophetic in that Charles Spurgeon says, there's none like this psalm in all of the psalms. For David prophetically gives us a photograph of the Lord's saddest hours. That here David writes from a poetic perspective for himself, but from a prophetic perspective for Christ. This psalm is so powerful that David is wondering why does an anointed king find himself without any help or any answer from heaven. And so the words that he initiates this psalm with are the same words that Jesus uttered on the cross. David says, my God, my God. He uses that word El, which was a Canaanite term that was used for the head of the Canaanite pantheon. It was a Canaanite phrase that David borrows from a poetic standpoint to lift God, Yahweh, over any of the monks, the Canaanite pantheon. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? He says, God, I'm crying to you in the daytime, but yet you don't say a word. It's not because I'm not anointed. You said your son, you sent the prophet Samuel to my father's house and the anointing oil would not pour on any of my older brothers. It poured on my head. I know you anointed me. It's not because you have not been with me. It was you who kept me out in my father's sheep pasture that day when the lion came to devour my father's sheep and the bear came to devour me. You gave me help from on high to kill the lion and the bear. You empowered me to kill that great Philistine giant from Gath by the name of Goliath. So there's no doubt about the fact that you're with me. God, I know you're with me. I know you've called. I know you've anointed me. But yet, why is it that I've called you? And I can't hear a word in response. Is it because I lack faith? Is it because of my sin? What is it? David in some type of hyperbolic prophecy suggests that there are times in all of our lives when you may feel that heaven is silent. We pray, we've prayed for you to heal our land. We pray, we've been singing since we were kids to bless America. We said that through song, God bless America. God, and the best you can do is Bush. <laughs> Obviously. You must be silent. Let me ask you a question. Let me just, let me be real, man to man, man to woman, straight, straight. Have you ever, have you ever wondered that God really hear you at times? Have you ever gone through something that was so difficult and so debilitating that it made you wonder, is prayer really powerful? Does prayer really work? Have you ever prayed about something until you were blue in the face, but yet it seems that that answer still has not come yet? And the question I want to raise to you is this. What do you do in life when you find yourself dealing with the silence from heaven? 
What do you do when you ask God over and 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 over for one thing and yet that one thing is so evasive and pervasive. It seems that heaven literally is silence. How do you overcome the silence of heaven? Are you interested? Well, I hope you're interested. If you're not, too bad. I'm going to preach this one for me. What do you do when there's no word from on high? There are four things I'm going to lift, and then I'll take my seat. My brothers and my sisters, whenever you've been talking to God, and God has not been talking back to you, whenever it seems, my sister and my brother, that heaven inside of the first thing I want to tell you is this. You've got to decide to give the Father worship. I said, you've got to decide to give the Father worship. Look at verse number one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. I cry in the night season, but I am not silent. I can't find rest. God, I've been praying. I've been praying. You're silent. I can't sleep. I'm upset. You're not talking back to me. But in spite of that, verse 3, but thou. I wish I had a Bible reader here. That's the problem with church folk. You don't know when they shout. But thou art holy. In other words, although I'm upset, although I can't hear from you, although you're not answering me, that still has nothing to do with the fact that you are still my pain has nothing to do with your position I am frustrated I don't understand but guess what you hold it so I lift my hands even with unanswered prayer and just say one word hold it is there anybody around this house, even when the heaven has been silent on you, you've made up in your mind that you're not going to look at God based on your circumstances because although you're broke, he's not. Although you're weak, he's not. Although you, don't be, although you may be crying, he's still sovereign. And I've learned to say, you know what? Praise is what I do. Even when I'm going through, I vow to praise you in the good or the bad, whether I'm happy or whether I'm sad. As a matter of fact, uh, oh, magnificent the Lord with me let us exalt his name together I will bless the Lord at all times that his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul shall make her boast in the Lord the humble shall hear thereof and be glad make a joyful noise all ye lands serve the Lord with gladness come before his presence with singing know ye that the Lord is God why don't you shake somebody's hand and say, he's still holy. He's still on the throne. He's still got the power. He's still worthy. Can anybody say, I'll still bless him. If he answers me, I'll praise him. If he's silent, I'll worship. If I'm crying, I'll lift my hands. He's worthy. Oh. Stop looking at your situation and start looking at him. Don't matter who's in the White House. He's still holy. The angels cast their crown before the great right throne. You know what they cry, don't you? Holy. The hymn writer say, holy. Holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Y'all don't feel it in me here. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Holy. When heaven is silent, you got to decide to give the Father worship. 
you're holy. That's a term of worship. But not only are you holy, David says you inhabit the praises of your people. That means whatever praise goes forth. In Hebrew, it literally means God makes his throne on top of praise. He sits on top of wherever he finds praise. If you want God to sit on top of your home, if you want God to sit on top of your finances, I double dog dare you to lift up some praise. Because when praises go up, not only will do blessings come down, but the blesser hung them down. So if you're going to overcome the, the silence of heaven, you've got to decide to give the Father worship. But once you've made a decision to give the Father worship, secondly, if you're going to overcome the silence of heaven, the second thing you got to do is this. Don't let folk determine your worth. Don't let folks determine your worth. Look what he says. He says, he says, he says in verse number four and five, our fathers trusted you. They trusted you delivered them. They cried. They got delivered. They trusted you. They were not conf confounded. You know, other folk, they trusted you. They got blessed. But look what he says in verse number six. But I am... A worm. As a matter of fact, not only does he call himself an animal, he says, I'm not even a man. David is so confused that he voluntarily relinquishes his own manhood. Now, normally, uh, the manhood is something that an ordinary man would fight for if he ain't got nothing. Come on, help me hear somebody. I mean, when a man is so proud, sometimes we hold on to manhood if we ain't got nothing else. But David says, I'm a word. I'm not even a man. And I wanted to know, David, why do you call yourself a word? Why do you relinquish your own manhood? He says in verse 6, I'm a reproach of men. I'm despised of the people. Verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out of the lip. They shake their heads saying he trusts in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing that he delighteth in him. He says, you know why I fear I'm a worm? You know why I fear I'm not a man? He's saying because I'm so messed up. Here it is, and people are laughing at me. He says, folk are talking about me. They're putting me down. They're shooting out of the lip, talking about, oh, he's supposed to be a Christian. He's supposed to trust in God. He's supposed to believe. Look at him now. So when David heard what the folk said about him, in response to what people said, now he said about himself, I'm a worm. I'm not a man. Let me say something to you. When heaven is silent, let me help you here. Don't ever view yourself through the lenses of others. And part of the problem around this church today is a lot of us base our value and our worth upon others' estimation. But one of the greatest things you can be delivered from after you've been delivered from sin is when you're delivered from the disease to please. And you understand that your destiny is not tied 
it into other people's understanding and estimation of your worth. And so you've got to get the strength to say, I may be jacked up, heaven may be silent, but I thank God that I'm not what folks say I am. Help me, Holy Ghost. When you look real down deep and say, God, I know what they're saying. I know they're talking, but I'm so glad that I am what you say I am. They say I'm jacked up. They say I'm nothing. They say I'm tore up from the flow up. But you say I'm an heir. You say I'm a joint heir. You say I'm a holy nation. You say I'm a royal priesthood. You say I'm a peculiar people. You say I'm a Christian. You say I'm your child. You say I'm the head. You say I'm not the tail. You say I'm blessed in the city. You say I'm blessed in the field. You say I live on top and not the bottom. Is there anybody around this house? Thank God that I'm not what other people say I am but I am what God said I am because in life no matter what you do somebody's going to have something to say Woo! especially in the church Nobody can be more cruel than church folk. I thank God God has let me develop some thick skin. And now I know who determines my worth and my value. And that's not people. So you do what God has called you to do. Help me hear somebody. Sometimes when you're in the church and you see the church growing, people say, we got too many people in the church. But if nobody joined, they say, you ain't doing nothing. don't feel me here huh when you're single they say you ought to get married when you get married they say you married the wrong somebody don't have no kids they say you're not family oriented get three or four kids they say you got too many y'all ain't feeling me here wear old suit they say you're raggedy buy a new suit they say you're flamboyant drive an old car they say you represent us wrong buy a new car they say you're still in the church's money you just can't satisfy people But if there anybody around this house learn to thank God that you are what God says you are, why don't you shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, maybe you don't like it when people get loud in church. But if that's your problem, go get you another seat. I didn't ask you to sit by me in the front place. Because I will bless the Lord. Somebody say, yeah! Don't let other folk determine your worth. If you're going to overcome the silence of heaven, number one, decide to give the Father worship. Number two, don't let other people, the other folk determine your worth. But third, if you're going to overcome the signs of heaven, once you've decided to give the Father worship, once you understand that you don't let folk determine your worth, thirdly, determine who has favored you the whole way. I said determine who has favored you the whole way. I don't get it, do it. It's right here in the text. Look what he said right here in verse number seven. In verse eight, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying he trusted on the Lord. That the Lord would deliver him. Let the Lord deliver him now, saying that David delighted in him. He says, but know what I did? Verse number nine. But thou art he that took me of the womb. You are the one who gave me some hope when my mama was feeding me. He said, you know my problem? I kept looking at what they were saying. And I lost my manhood. I considered myself to be an animal. 
because of their mockery and their laughing. But then I thought about it. After I relinquished my manhood and thought about what they were saying, you know what I did? I looked back and I said, you know what? When my daughter Jesse and my mama came together, that night, Luther Vandross was playing at one tweezy on Bethlehem Boulevard. My daddy got a babysitter for my older brothers and took my mama out to dinner that night. He said to my wife, baby, he said to my mama, baby, would you have an objection if a man of my complexion came in your direction and offered to be your protection? Y'all ain't feeling me here. <laughs> Y'all help me preach here. My mom and my daddy came together and that night. They produced and conceived me. Y'all ain't feeling me here. Between their union, it formed a zygote. The zygote became an embryo. The embryo became a fetus. I went to the first, second, and third trimesters. And then God gave me a prenatal connection. But you know what I thought about while the people were laughing and while the people were thought, talking? I looked back over my life and I said to myself, why am I worried about what they are saying? Because it was you that kept me in my mama's womb. It was you that gave me hope when my mama was breastfeeding me. So what I'm going to start doing is looking back over the past chapter of my life. Before the haters came along, I had you. Before the critics came along, I had the creator. Before the jealousy came along, I had Jehovah. You've been with me all the way. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look back over the past chapter of my life and say to myself, it's been you all the way nobody but you and me so I'm not concerned about what they're saying because they didn't bring me they didn't keep me they didn't watch over me they didn't wake me up this morning do I have a witness in here and the next time somebody looks at you funny when you go up in praise tell them if you don't know my story don't criticize my praise where were you when I was catching hell where were you when I was down to my last damn? I ain't shouting for you. I ain't trying to be seen. I ain't trying to impress you. But I recognize it was nobody but the Lord who brought me all the way. Somebody shout, ow, ow, ow. Somebody shout, ow. Somebody, this ain't for you, this ain't for you, this ain't for you, this ain't for you, this ain't, for you, this ain't. but it's to give him glory, it's to give him honor. He's worthy, worthy. And so, David. David said, if you're going to overcome the silence of heaven, number one, you've got to decide to give the Father worship. And then once you've made that decision to give the Father worship, David says, don't let folk determine your worth. Third of David says, if you're going to overcome the silence of heaven, you've got to determine who's favored you the whole way. And that's why the old deacon was saying, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for my journey. Why? Because you brought me. I said, you brought me. You brought me 
from a mighty long way. My granddaddy was saying, Lord, you brought me from the rocking of my cradle. Far you brought me from a mighty long way. Do I have a witness in here? Once you've decided to give the Father worship, once you don't let folk determine your worth, uh, yeah, once you determine who gives you favor the whole way. Fourthly, David says, if you're going to overcome the silence of heaven, you've got to declare that you'll speak a word. You've got to declare that you'll faithfully speak a word. What do you mean, do it? David said in verse 19, be not thou far from me. My Lord and my strength. He says, hurry up, Lord, to give me some help. He says, deliver my soul from the sword. Deliver my darling from the power of the dog. And, uh, save me from the mouth of the lions. And uh, you've heard me from the unicorn's horns. And uh, I heard uh, David saying uh, that if you would deliver me, and uh, if you would be close to me, oh Lord, uh, if you will hurry on up to help me and deliver my soul from the sword. Look at verse 22. And David saying, I promise and that I will declare your name unto my brethren. Yeah. In the midst of the congregation will I give your name the praise. Do I have a witness in here? David says uh, that when you uh, make up your mind uh, to deliver me, uh, help me, Holy Ghost, to preach your word. Uh, when you hurry on up to help me, uh, and uh, when I cast my cares uh, on you, uh, because uh, you, you still care care for me and I promise you Lord that when you bring me out I'll declare your name before the whole congregation he says now I used to be scared of the crowd I used to be offended because of the folk but once you bring me salvation I'll go back into the same place before the same people uh, who call me everything but a child of God. And as soon as I get in the church, I'm going to act a plum fool in worship. As soon as you bring me out, Lord, I'm going to give your name the praise. Is there anybody in the room today expecting God to open up the heavens? Is there anybody here promised the Lord that when the Lord brings you some deliverance, that you're not going to be sedity, bourgeois, and dignified. But when the Lord brings you your deliverance, you're going to praise his name before the congregation. Do I have a witness in here? Why don't you look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm looking for God to open up the heavens. Say, neighbor, I've been praying for one or two things. And say, neighbor, when you see me run around this church one Sunday or one Wednesday, you'll know I got my answer. I'm going to declare his name before the whole congregation. Is there anybody here who's looking for God to do a miracle? Is there anybody here looking for God? 
done uh, to bring you some breakthrough. Uh, why don't you lift your hand and say, Lord, uh, I'm ready uh, to declare your name uh, before greater travels rest. Uh, I don't care if I got a new outfit on. Uh, I don't care if I have a new makeup. Uh, I don't care if I got new clothes on. Uh, but when you uh, give me my deliverance, uh, I'll tell the whole world uh, if it had not been uh, for your mercy and your grace if it had not been uh, for you watching all over me uh, is there anybody here uh, who still believes uh, the Lord will uh, make a way out of no way uh, touch two people uh, say he's gonna do it for you uh, he's gonna do it for me uh, do I have a witness uh, and I look back at him as a neighbor I'm next in line uh, for a miracle uh, say neighbor uh, while on others that are calling uh, he's not gonna pass me by uh, I'm gonna bless his name uh, throughout the seas of ages uh, as a matter of fact I will uh, bless the Lord uh, at all times uh, is there anybody here uh, who's looking for God uh, to heal you of cancer uh, let me see you wave your hand uh, somebody got prostate cancer let me see you wave your hand uh, is there anybody here uh, looking for a new job wave your hand is there anybody here praying for a child to get their business in order wave your hand is there anybody here looking for a new job making more money wave your hand is there any college student in here looking for God to get you through in four years wave your hand now if you believe it you all not I'm to the valley of Ola. You ought to go ahead. Give him glory while you got a chance. Don't wait until tomorrow. But go ahead. He's worthy to be praised. I say he's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the honor. See ya. I got to take my seat, but shake two hands. Say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Say, I'm going to bust out and praise because he's going to give me deliverance. Do you believe the best thing yet to come? I said, do you believe he's able? Say, yeah. Tell somebody, watch me get my miracle. Say, neighbor, do me a favor. Clear my breakthrough is on the way. Clear my miracle is on the way. Yeah.
Listen, if you're in this place, somebody said, do it, you talking to me. Seems like heaven has been silent. Forgive me. I'm trying to. I didn't mean to go this five minutes. Oh, oh, oh. I'm talking to somebody. Say, preacher, it seemed like, seemed like heaven has just been silent. I can't seem to hear nothing. like God not answering my prayers. See that the more I try, the more I pray, the worse things get. Well, whenever heaven is silent, God is up to something. <laughs> you may not see it. But you all just tell him, Lord, I promise you that once you do it, I will declare your name. No matter what people say, I'm going to tell them, if it had not been for you, who was on my side? Sometimes God wants to see where you trust him and where you love him, even when you don't get what you want. If you're in this house today, you say, preacher, you've been talking to me. God sent you. I wasn't supposed to preach this message like this. But you're saying, preacher, you're talking to me. I want you to get to this altar now. I want you to get to this altar now. If, if you felt that God was speaking to you through this message, I want you to get to this altar now. He's bringing, 
them, sister. Pray them. Pray them. Keep patiently waiting. Keep patiently waiting. For I know. For I know. Can we say it? Can we say it? Why don't you lift your hands? It bring you out. It's bringing you out. Listen, everybody touch on somebody. Everybody touch on That's now being held. You know our thoughts are far off. Your word tells us you know the number of hairs upon our heads. You know what you know we need even before we ask you. So now, Lord, we come today as conduits of your favor. Lord, this hand that will now touch it. We squeeze a breakthrough now. The same way that we feel the touch of this hand. We want to feel the kiss of your favor. We want you to speak a word from on high. Somebody's been waiting a long time for you to move right now. So every hand that we're touching, don't just bless us, but bless our neighbor. Take our neighbor to another level. Give them what they need. We don't stand selfish. Bless everybody on my left. And bless everybody on my right. Open up the wonders of heaven. Pour us out a blessing 
open up the floodgates of heaven. We don't want to leave the same way we came. And we promise you right now in advance when you bless us, we'll give you glory. We promise you when you give, give deliverance, we will give you honor. We promise you we will not be ashamed of your gospel. So touch any person who has a need. Let them know in the next seven days that you've heard our prayer. Let them know in the next seven days that you granted our petition. Let them know in the seven days that your will will come to pass in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen.